Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Neil Howard, here on Health Professional Radio. Thank you for joining us for another segment. We're going to be speaking this evening with Dr. Veronica Gillespie-Bell. She's joining us here to talk about uterine fibroids and uh, some of their very serious symptoms. Welcome to Health Professional Radio, Dr. Gillespie-Bell. Thank you. Thank you. Well, give our listeners a bit of your professional background. Introduce us uh, to what it is that you do and what you love about what you do. And then let's talk a bit about what uterine fibroids are. Sure. I'm a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist. I practice at Oshner Kenner um, here in uh, Kenner, Louisiana, right outside of, of New Orleans. Um, I, at Oshner Kenner, I am the section head and senior site lead of women's services. And I also am the director of quality for women's services for the Oshner Health System. I also serve as the minimally, uh, excuse me, the medical director of the Minimally Invasive Center for the Treatment of Uterine Fibroids. And I really have built my uh, clinical career around making sure that women have options for treating their fibroids. Now, what exactly are uterine fibroids? What causes them and and who's mostly affected? So fibroids are benign tumors of the uterus. Um, They come from a single smooth muscle cell and they are um, actually 80 percent of black women have fibroids by the time they're 50 70% of white women have fibroids by the time they're 50. However, black women have um, more of an effect or they are more symptomatic in their reproductive years. Is there an underlying cause for for that condition in black women? You know, we actually don't know what causes fibroids and we don't know why black women are more affected. Um, We know that black women, again, are affected in their earlier reproductive years and tend to be more symptomatic, but we don't know the reason why. Now, do uterine fibroids interfere with reproduction or conception? So fibroids themselves don't cause infertility, but they can cause problems with pregnancy depending on the location. For example, if there are fibroids that are inside the lining of the uterus in the endometrial cavity, that can increase the risk for miscarriage. You said that black women are affected in their younger reproductive years and that 80 percent of black women have them by the time that they're uh, 50, 70 percent of white women have them by the time that they're 50. Is this something that can affect women at any age? Yes, really, women can can be affected at any age, um, and a lot of women have fibroids and are asymptomatic. Um, but women that do have symptoms uh, often suffer suffer from heavy menstrual bleeding, painful cycles, sometimes painful intercourse. Uh, sometimes there's pressure on the bladder or pressure in the pelvis in general. Now, when these uh, asymptomatic women have these fibroids, are they detected through a regular checkup? Is there a timetable when women should be checked for them? So there's not a screening that we use for fibroids mm-hmm. um, as they are benign. However, most women that are diagnosed with fibroids, it either is during a pelvic exam when they are felt or through radiologic imaging, as you mentioned, um, such as ultrasound, CT scan, MRI. What's the normal course of uh, action once fibroids are discovered? Are they always something that need to be treated or can sometimes fibroids fibroids, uh, be left untreated and cause no problem at all? Yeah, a lot of times fibroids can be present and there are no symptoms and they're not affecting anything and so they can be left in situ. We don't have to do anything about it. It really depends on, for women that are presenting, what symptoms they're having and what their goals are in terms of reproduction and in terms of uterine conservation. So how are they normally treated once they are causing problems? So we have a variety of treatments, and as I mentioned at the beginning of our program, that really has been my clinical goal is to make sure that women understand um, that there are surgical and non-surgical options, and again, options that will allow them to maintain their fertility and options that allow them to maintain their uterus. So we have some oral treatments. Um, Orion is the first FDA-approved oral medication for treating heavy menstrual bleeding associated with fibroids. Um, And so that is a great option for those women women that are having heavy menstrual bleeding and either don't want to have surgery or they want to they may need to have surgery, but want to have it in the future. And then we have other um, other options that will not necessarily treat um, the fibroids, but may treat some of the associated symptoms. 
um, some other medications um, like transamic acid, which is, again, not really for fibroids, but it's for women that have heavy bleeding or have bleeding, period. We actually use it um, even for some obstetric indications. Um, and then there are surgical options, such as removing the fibroids, doing radiofrequency ablation of the fibroids. Of course, a hysterectomy is uh, also a definitive option. You mentioned heavy bleeding. Do fibroids disrupt the menstrual cycle at all? Is the heavy bleeding due to the menstrual cycle and it's heavy because of fibroids? Or do these fibroids uh, initiate bleeding that's not menstrual uh, cycle at all? So that's a great question. So the fibroids can cause heavy menstrual bleeding, but they can also cause intermenstrual bleeding. So when cycles are starting to become irregular and bleeding that happens in between periods, that can be caused by fibroids as well. When a woman chooses the surgical route, are we talking a long period of recovery? Are we talking recurrence of fibroids? So there are a couple of surgical options, and really depending on the surgical option, that would determine the recovery time. So, for example, I perform uh, robotic-assisted myomectomies, depending on the size and the number of fibroids, and that has a shorter recovery time, a two- to four-week recovery time, compared to the traditional myomectomy where we make a bikini cut and take out fibroids that way, that's a four to six week recovery time. Same thing if it's a hysterectomy and we're able to perform a minimally invasive approach such as vaginal, laparoscopic, or robotic, um, that does seem to have a shorter recovery time than if we need a big incision. Now, um, for those patients that have the fibroids removed through a myomectomy, um, there is a risk of recurrence. Um, I usually tell my patients, um, especially if they're younger, it's a high risk that those fibroids will come back. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of the surgery itself, um, there are, of course, risks that go along with having any surgery, bleeding, infection, risk of injury to adjacent organs. And so all of those are uh, risks that go along with having either the surgery to remove fibroids or a hysterectomy where you're removing the entire uterus. Give us a bit more information about Orion, if you would. Does it work to shrink fibroids or simply render them even less troublesome than sometimes they already are? Yeah, so fibroids grow because they have estrogen and progesterone receptors. And we naturally produce estrogen and progesterone, which then makes the fibroids grow. And so Orion is a GnRH antagonist, and so it downregulates the estrogen production. So then you don't have that hormone there that's feeding the fibroids. And so um, the clinical trials look specifically at heavy menstrual bleeding, and so we do know that it reduces the amount of bleeding that a, um, that a woman has during her menstrual cycle. Now, in terms of the size of the fibroids, um, that's not something that was studied in the clinical trials. It may be um, information that, that they uh, have that they may reveal later. But for now, the medication is specifically for heavy menstrual bleeding, um, and, and it decreases the blood loss. Well, what about some of the side effects of Oriana? Um, so there are some side effects, as there are with any medication. Because it is a GnRH antagonist and it lowers estrogen, then we see some of those side effects that we have when we're in a low estrogen state. So mainly hot flushes, headaches, nausea. In the clinical trials, about 22% of participants had hot flushes. For example, that was the most common side effect. But only 1% of women discontinued the trial because of it. Um, with that hypoestrogenic state that, that Orion places a woman in, because again, that's how the fibroids are treated, um, there is a little bit of estrogen and progestin in Orion mm -hmm. to help mitigate those symptoms that we have when we're in a hypoestrogenic state, but there's not enough estrogen or progestin to then make the fibroids grow. Doctor, give us a website where we can learn more about Orion, if you would, and about the uh, other treatment options available for uterine fibroids. Sure. Um, listeners can learn more at orion.com. That's O-R-I-A-H-N-N.com. And if individuals want to learn more about fibroids in general, um, they can always uh, visit our site at um, ashna.org. Um, there's good information from the CDC. Um, actually, July is Fibroid Awareness Month, so there's lots of information um, out right now about fibroids. Also, the White Dress Foundation um, it also has a lot of really good information about fibroid patients can be advocates 
um, for their own care and the, how they need to be prepared and what questions they should ask when they're visiting the doctor. Doctor, I appreciate you joining us here on Health Professional Radio, giving us this information. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Dr. Veronica Gillespie-Bell. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio. 